scripture says that no man loves his brother and claims to know God, he's a non-believer because God is love. And Lord, there are people that are unlovable around us and the only way we can do that is through your unconditional love that you show up especially through your son Jesus that died and paid our sin, our ransom. Lord Jesus, we're all aware that it should have been us on that cross. But you paid the price. You paid it in full. You overcame death. And Lord, we have a peace in knowing that our last breath on this earth is our first breath in heaven. And Lord, we can fear not because of that. Lord, I want you to touch all the people that are here this morning with your love, mercy, and grace. There are widows here that need you to wrap your loving arms around them. There may be a single mom or a single dad that's craving for love. And Lord, you're a, a, a God of the fatherless, a God of the widow. You're a God of everybody. And you can show them your love, mercy, and grace. Lord, cover us all. Like Mark said, we are good at wearing masks, Lord. Each one of us have our own dysfunction, our own hurt, our own pain. And you know it all. Lord, we can't hide from anything. Everything's exposed to you. So help us lay it at your feet. Call on your name. And Lord, expect a miracle a blessing to settle down over us and our family. So Lord, we commit the rest of this service into your will and care. Lord, there are visitors here this morning. We're all part of the body. Help them to feel welcome. Help them to hear a word that will touch their hearts and minds forever. Lord, we need you more now than we ever have needed you before. So we thank you for your presence. And we do it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Before you sit down, love on somebody. There are a lot of new faces here this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. about the church. I'm excited about getting into Acts here. Uh, you know, does anybody here believe our time's getting short that Jesus is coming back? If he doesn't, we're in serious trouble. But we need to be the church. It's time for the church to be the church. Mark, get up here, you rascal. And uh, I'm really excited to get into Acts. Peter is going to do the first half of Acts, and then uh, Paul, Paul gets into the last half. And it's going to be exciting to study the Word, but I kind of wrestled with what we were going to do today, and I asked Mark to come up here, and uh, I've got a few notes, but we're just going to let the Spirit lead us, and we're going to kind of team preach and go through. We've only got five scriptures here, so that'll only take about four and a half hours. <laughs> 
fellowship of believers is a heading in my Bible. We're going to be in Acts, the third or second chapter, and we're going to start in verse 42. And Peter has talked and listened and watched, and they ask questions. What must we do to be saved? And boy, did Peter have an answer. And I want us, as the body of Christ, as individuals, to work on our individual testimony. There will be a day soon, the worse this, this world gets, that somebody is going to ask you a question. Why do you believe in Jesus Christ? And you know, it's amazing. A lot of us beat ourselves up because we don't really, really, oh, oh Pastor, I don't, I don't have the scripture. It's not in my mind. It doesn't need to be in your mind. It needs to be in your heart. And when you became a born-again believer, when you asked Jesus into your heart as Lord and Savior, you were instantly indwelled with the Holy Spirit. And that's what caused a lot of this confusion. Everybody broke out speaking in the tongue. And it was for the language so people from all nations and tribes that had gathered there could understand the gospel. And it caused a rift. And man, I'm telling you, it caused a rift in churches yet today, the speaking of tongues. It split churches all over the world. But for this particular case, God used it to start the church. And he, he settled the Holy Spirit down over these 12 men that Jesus had poured his life into for three years. And they finally had the scales removed from their eyes and their ears opened. And they understood what Jesus was trying to teach them. And you and I, if we can think back for those of us that got saved, there are a lot of us here, praise God, that were born into the faith. And we've never not known Jesus. Oh, thank God for you. But there are people like me that was a miserable, terrible sinner. And I got saved by the grace of God. And do I have a story to tell? And it's Jesus. And Peter remembered Jesus saying, I'm going to go. And you need to go and make disciples and teach them everything that I've taught you. And, and it started the first church. Peter had the opportunity, because of this speaking in tongues that broke out and caused controversy, he had a chance to do the first sermon. And it's in verse 41 of... Uh, Acts 2, it says, those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Oh my gosh. But you know what? There's a thing there that says those who accepted his message. And you and I are responsible to give that message. We're not responsible to beat them up until they accept it because God gives us a free will. And I've got a, a Muslim girl living, Karen and I do. She's from Afghanistan. She came over for back surgery. And, uh, oh, my God, she's in a pastor's house. And she's in trouble. But it's me that's in trouble because I have to take time to minister her. That girl is 20 years old. All she knows is Islam. There could be Catholics sitting here right now, and you were born and raised Catholic. And that is what you know and what you believe. So we have to be careful. But this Jesus, the story of Jesus, is so, so important. And we need to get it in our hearts. And Mark, I just asked him this morning if he'd step up here and help me. He doesn't have any notes, see? So the Holy Spirit's got to lead us this morning, and that's what we need to do more of in our churches today. We can uh, sit down for hours and get an outline going, and oh my gosh, we got to go word for word so we don't make a mistake. But you know what? The Holy Spirit won't allow us to make a mistake. He gives us everything we need to give the word. 
and to touch hearts and souls for him. So we're going to start in verse 32, Mark, and uh, we're in Acts, the second chapter, verse 42. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Key word, devoted. We see very little devotion in the church universal today. We live in a society, a culture, where there might be something better, and we won't commit, we won't devote to the Lord or to anything else other than ourselves. And we've turned from the Lord inward. And not all of us. And I always tell people, uh, I get accused of preaching negative and everything. I'm a realist. It's a, there's real reality to all this. And we can watch and listen. Scripture says you'll know them by their fruit. And we see a lot of people that aren't devoted to God and to the church. But they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. We're responsible to grow. We're responsible to be taught. It was Jesus' command to the disciples to go and teach. So we're responsible to learn. Uh, we just got out of John 15 uh, several weeks ago. And anything attached to the vine grows. So if you're not growing, if you're stalled, you need to get reattached to the vine. You need to be taught and study this word a little deeper. You know, I want to just uh, mention, as pastor came to me this morning and he said what he was preaching on, and I was looking at the, through the Bible, and I, what came to me is 1 Peter 3.15, and he said, But in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks, asks you to give a reason for the hope that we have in us, right? We're, we're, we're supposed to be ready, and we're, we, it doesn't mean we need to be a theo theologian, but with gentleness and respect, we need to be prepared for others. You know, you guys know I like to tell stories, and I'd read a story one time where this, this teenage girl, she ran home and said, Mom, after all those years of first aid class, I finally got to put it to use. I found, there was an accident on the way home, and there was a man, and he had broken his leg, and there was a, a, a woman, and she was a little bloody, and there was two kids crying. And the mom said, what did you do? She said, well, I went over, just like first aid taught me, I went over to the curb and I sat down and I put my head between my knees so I wouldn't pass out. <laughs> Sometimes... In, in our in our spiritual walk we're so concerned about ourselves that we forget that we're actually growing for others too and we're we're putting that 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 study habits we're putting that being ready we're putting that preparedness in for others not just us sometimes we get in, a, in our little shells and our in, in our walls at home and we're concerned about how we're supposed to live and what we're supposed to do and what we don't know is we're touching others and this pastor's my pastor mike is talking here he's talking about touching others he's talking about that fellowship we have with one another he's talking about spreading the gospel and not just to ourselves sometimes it's easy to be in our homes and just and just worry about that bible and, and our relationship with the lord but we're called to do something much greater absolutely all of us have an idea of what the church should be like don't we i know uh right now at destiny we're running a lot of times 10 12 new people a week visiting People are searching, they're, they're hungry for something. And all of us have an idea, an expectation of what the church should be. It isn't the building, it's obvious this morning, here we sat in a grassy field with the sky above and, and the threat of rain, and you're crazy enough to be right here, listening to God's word. It isn't about the building. Uh, we just bought the old IGA grocery store in Kinderville, and we're restoring that building. Uh, we're hopefully going to be in it the first week of November. It isn't about that building. That building is going to become a tool for us to do more things for the Lord. But it isn't necessary. We can see right now, we can hold church right here in a grassy field. Programs for the kids. We expect programs for the kids, and you know that's probably one of the number one uh, church growth tools that there's, God is using right now is our children. If we've got a good youth program in our churches, then people will bring their children, and then the children will bring the parents. 
it happens. We see it time and time again. So it's so important for kids. But it isn't about the programs. Social events. A lot of us go to church for social reasons. That's why the ice cream social was invented. So they could go to get together and crank ice cream and, and talk and, and be social with one another. And that's even dying out today. Songs and worship. For a couple hours we come to church and praise God and worship and hear what he has to say and bless God that preacher, preacher better have a good word for me or else. And then we go home and it isn't a half hour, 45 minutes, we've forgotten what it was all about. It's easy to do, we're so busy. I was thinking the other day, I, I, could, I couldn't remember what I was trying to, and I sat there and I thought, Lord, what's up with this? And he was just telling me I got so much stuff in my mind, he had to relieve some of it for the new stuff. But I don't think that's right. I just think I'm getting old. <laughs> Church, we find out, is the people. The, it isn't about the building. It amazed me. I don't know how many bands we had here uh, over the weekend. Probably 10, close to 10. And every one of them got up here and said, please, it's not about us. If you applaud, applaud the Lord. It was so refreshing to hear that, that it isn't about what we do, the programs, the building. It's about the people. Acts 2.41, as I said, they accepted his message, were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. We've got denominational uh, churches all around and even non-denominational churches that there are a thousand and one hoops you have to jump through to get saved. And it isn't hard. Romans uh, 10, 9 and 10 explains that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that he, he was dead, buried, and resurrected, a new creation, you shall be saved. It's simple. And I always tell everybody, you know, there are the, all these hoops and expectations and, and rules and regulations we've got to do to be a member of a church. And Jesus was the prime example being on the cross with a thief on both sides of him. And they both had the same opportunity. And one made rude remarks to him. And the other one said, Lord, remember me today when you enter the kingdom. It's that easy to be saved. But oh my God, the walk ahead after you do it is a bear. It is not easy. And that's why Jesus sent the Holy Spirit and settled down over these people. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship. When was the last time you walked into your church and served and made sure that you looked at a frowny face and walked over and asked them, is there some way I can help you or pray for you? We're to be devoted to the fellowship. And we're all the fellowship. The fellowship is the body of Christ. It isn't Lutheran. It isn't Catholic. It isn't male or female or Jew or Gentile. It is every one of us that has accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And it's our heart's desire at Destiny Family of Faith in Kinderville for the churches in this community, this county, to get in unity and one accord and do something for Jesus. That's why we do this. And if you're set here from another church and you want your church to lead this next year, fam jam, have at her. This is not a destiny family of faith thing. This is a community thing. And it's our prayer that it fills this whole 10 acres to where we can't even, the cops are going to have to park us. We even prayed last night they'd let the guys in jail over there out in the yard so they could hear the worship, but we didn't see anybody. It has to be unity in one accord. 
It was so amazing as the band shared. They were talking. Uh, you, you should have been here. The, the worship this morning was mild compared to what we've had this weekend. Uh, the last band that closed out last night, i got to share a story quick. He had the drums there on the carpet. And his drum head, what was that thing, a skull? That was a skull. Oh, my wife flipped out. <laughs> what is he doing with a skull up there? And these guys had tattoos and holy clothes. What are the things in the air? Hoops, loops, hoops, loops, hoops, whatever they are. And you know they praised Jesus with all their heart. It was so amazing. And when we got done, and I was standing out there talking to the drummer, and here he's a pastor in Fort Wayne. They go downtown and minister to the druggies. They walk right in with the gangs. And they do demonic oppression, uh, satanic. They do witchcraft. They go in and play their music in these places. And he had that skull in the front of that. They just had served down there in a, in a downtown in an area that is so rough the cops don't even want to go. And they loaded their drums up and come up here. And we, we were standing out there talking. He says, oh, my God. And I said, what's the matter? He said, I forgot to change my drum head. <laughs> you know what? Paul said, I become all things to all people so that some might be saved. And we have to get one accord, church. We have to get together. We have to be free in Jesus Christ to do all things for all people so that some might be saved. While we're here arguing and bickering, bickering and fighting and wondering if we're going to sing a Chris Tomlin or if we're going to sing a hymn that was written to a barroom tune 300 years ago, we're letting Jesus' word, his hope, love, mercy, and grace go by the wayside while somebody's dying inside. We have to stop that. Devoted themselves to the fellowship. You want to add anything to that? Yeah, you know, some people, like it said, they're okay with fellowship as long as that fellow's in their ship. Right. Because um, they, they don't want to leave their comfort zone. And I was thinking about... Um, some encounters Jesus had. And I was thinking about how Nicodemus came to Jesus and had that one-on-one -on -one encounter. I was thinking about how Zacchaeus and Jesus, you know, they, they had supper at Zacchaeus' house and Jesus says, I came to seek and save that which, which, which is lost. And I was thinking about that woman at the well, how Jesus went out of his way at certain times and certain people came to him um, because they needed an encounter from Christ. And sometimes when we think about fellowship, we don't want to take that extra mile and, and go out there and, and talk to some people who really need talk to. Again, people wear those masks that we were talking about earlier, and, and th they don't know how else to act. They put up the walls, and they put up the barriers, and they won't let anybody in, and they're hurting. And there's all kinds of people that are hurting. I bet there's some hurting people here today, and you just don't know how to say it. You don't know which way to turn, and you want the fellowship, and you come out here, and, and maybe... And maybe somebody needs to, to talk to you or you need to talk to somebody, but we stay quiet and we stay in our shell. But I believe that God wants us to reach out. I believe he wants us to fellowship. I, I believe he wants us to go the extra mile for the woman at the well. He wants us to, to entertain those people that come to us at night like Nicodemus. He wants us to talk to Zacchaeus, even though the whole the people at, at um, Jericho did not ha want anything to do with him. They were mad at Jesus for even talking to Zacchaeus. He's, he's a tax collector for the Romans. Yeah. What are you even ha socializing with him? Sometimes we think that, that Jesus just came for the good people. He came for all people. Amen. And we're all good in his eyes. And we all need to know that we're good in his eyes. And whether we have a, a, you know, a skull on our drum head or whether we have gauge earrings or tattoos or whether we've been in church all of our life, we need Jesus. And there's nothing we can do without Jesus. And we need that fellowship from the body of believers to just join in one mind and one accord and trust in each other and, 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 and communicate with each other and not just be the Christians inside of our four, four walls at home. Yes, absolutely.
they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the baking, breaking of bread, communion, communing with one another. You know, Adam and Eve sinned, and the first thing they did is went and hid. And God was used to walking and talking with them every night in the cool of the night. He wants us to remember. He wants to commune. He wants us to be together. He wants us to remember him. If I can add, aren't you glad that God came in the cool of the morning instead of the heat of the moment? That's right. <laughs> Some of us, we get caught in the heat of the moment, don't we? We lose our cool. Right. But God came. And, and I believe an almighty God knew what they did. And, and that's when they started their excuses and everything. The first thing he wanted to do was he blamed God. God, it's the woman that you gave me. You know, it's your fault. God, it's, it's the woman. You know, we want to blame. And sometimes we're hurting, and that's the first thing we do. Sometimes we do something wrong, and that's the first thing that we do. But I always think about that, that God came in the cool of the morning, not right. the heat of the Amen. moment. Good God. Breaking of bread. I know there are churches all over the land that would not, absolutely would not commune together. Some use juice, some use the wafer. I mean, that we can go on and on and on. And all God wants is us to commune with one another. It says into prayer. The major, major key to all this is prayer. We have to get on our knees, people. What breaks God's heart has to break our heart. There are so many things going on in our land. We've even got some serious things going on in our state right now. And we have to be on our knees praying. I think Abraham... Uh, with the negotiation, uh, if we can just find 40 people in there, will you spare us? Sure. Well, how about 30? And he works it down and works it down and works it down, and there's one left. And I think with all my heart, the reason the United States of America has been spared so far is because the church is on its knees praying yet. Don't ever give up on prayer. And it's like Mark says, don't wait till the heat of the moment to go to prayer. You be praying constantly. Man, one of the hardest things we can do is be humble and grab our wives' hands and pray with them. Because it's not only showing our heart, we're talking to God. And it's a hard thing to do. But I'm telling you, you are the spiritual leader of your home. And if you grab your wife's hand and pray for her and pray for your family, hang on to the and see how God opens heaven for you. We have to be on our knees and pray. Prayer is our communication from land to God. And I'm telling you, it's one of the most powerful things that we have on this earth. We have not because we ask not. Verse 43, everyone was filled with awe. When we devote ourselves to teaching and grow, when we're spirit filled, when we're belonging to a fellowship and we break bread with one another and we pray together, it causes awe. And I'm telling you, there are people that need to see awe in this land. And that's Jesus. It's a light. It's a spark in your eye. It's when you're happy and you ought to be mad. It's when you have something going on in your body that you can't control or help. And you're counting on the Lord to heal you. That is powerful. And when people see that work, when they see your faith, see you trusting it causes awe. God caused awe when he broke all those, those apostles out 